inside riches, healing of the mind. Yea, all I need in thee to find, O oh, Lamb of God, I come. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, He has removed your guilt forever. You are His own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to His will. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, fellow disciples of our Lord. Do you like gardening? It's interesting that in more than one place in Scripture, the Lord describes himself as a gardener. And it starts all the way back in the beginning, all the way back in Genesis, after God had created everything by the word of his mouth, after he had taken special time to create Adam and Eve, man and woman, he took time to plant a garden. And into this garden, he put the crown of his creation, man and woman. And in this garden, God provided everything that Adam and Eve needed. He provided plants and trees so that they could have something to eat. He gave them a purpose in their life by telling them to take care of the garden. He give, even gave them an opportunity to worship him in that garden by obeying his command. Everything that they could ever need or want was right there. And, and when God had told Adam and Eve to take care of the garden, it was a little bit different than what we might expect today because... They didn't have to worry about pulling weeds or picking rock. Everything was perfect. Weeds and thistles, that came after the fall into sin. And they didn't even need to set up an irrigation system because God had also provided a river to water that garden. But of course we know that that 
didn't last. Even though God had provided so much, Adam and Eve were tempted by the idea that something better was waiting for them. They could they could be like God. And because they fell into sin, well, <coughs> the world was corrupted. They were kicked out of that garden and nothing would ever be the same again. And yet as we go through scripture, we see that God continues with that picture of taking care of his garden. And in our lesson for this morning, taken from Isaiah, God uses this time a picture, a parable, of a garden, of a vineyard, to show how he continues to show his grace to his people and how, unfortunately, his people so often continue to rebel against him. So as we look at our lesson for this morning, we see that even though God's people fall short all the time, the Lord shows his love to his vineyard. The short Lord shows his love even when it is a struggle, and even though we do not deserve it. The Lord makes us the vineyard or the garden of his delight. Uh, We turn once again to our first lesson, Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah writes about the Lord and his care. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of its stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but he heard cries of distress. This is the word of our Lord. Now it's easy to see how this picture, this this parable that Isaiah uses is fulfilled in God's Old Testament people. Even though they had been turned into slaves in the land of Egypt, when they cried to the Lord for mercy, the Lord heard them. And he displayed his power when he sent Moses to lead the Israelites out of their slavery in Egypt and and into the wilderness. And even though they faced troubles, even though the Egyptian army came chasing after him once again, God showed his power by crushing the Egyptian army in the waters of the Red Sea, the same Red Sea that the Israelites had just passed through on dry land. And not only did the Lord lead them away from their suffering, He led them to something better. Just as God had promised, he led them to the edge of the land of Canaan, and it was just as good as God said it would be. After Moses sent several representatives into the land to survey the land, they came back and they had a report. We're told they gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. And they had brought back grapes and and pomegranates and and figs and, and all sorts of other things. God had kept his promise. And yet even though the people saw how God had kept his promise, they failed to put their trust in him. And as a result, they spent the next 40 years wandering around in the wilderness. And yet God was still faithful. After those 40 years, he brought them back to that promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, the vineyard on a fertile hill. And he allowed them to conquer that land. He made it clear as they came into the land, it was only by his power that they were able to conquer and live there. And yet once they set up shop in the land of Canaan, God continued to bless them. He continued to cause the sun to rise. He continued to make the rain come down on their crops. 
He continued to provide them with everything that they needed. He allowed his people to continue to be blessed as, as the borders of the land even expanded. And in his grace, the Lord also provided a way for them to, to worship him. Now, he had already given his ceremonial law at Mount Sinai years earlier that had all those different rules and regulations for the offerings and the, the, the sacrifices that they were to bring to the Lord. And when they were land of Israel, at one point he also allowed them to replace the tabernacle that they had used in the wilderness with a temple, a glorious temple that was built on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And so God had given them everything that they could ever need. And, and that's the picture. In the vineyard, God dug out the wine press. He, he put it up a watchtower. He built a, a fence around it. He did everything that he could for his people. And so we can understand in, in our picture for this morning why the Lord was disappointed when we are told then he looked for a crop of good grapes but it yielded only bad fruit. It's sort of interesting that term bad fruit can also be translated as sour grapes. Good for nothing, sour grapes. But what is this talking about? Well, through the years, the land continued to produce fruit. But what this picture is really talking about is what was going on in people's hearts. God had provided everything and yet the people were turning away from him. Instead of giving the Lord credit for their deliverance, for their blessings that they were receiving in the land that God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they started giving credit to other gods. They started giving glory and honor to gods like Baal and Astaroth and, and Molech, just to name a few. Instead of giving thanks to God for the blessings that he provided by worshiping in the way that he prescribed for his people, they chased after all sorts of idolatry. Instead of producing the good fruit that comes from faith that God wanted from his people, they continued to rebel against their God. And that's why Jeremiah would later write and, and use a very similar picture when he said, I have planted you like a choice vine of sound and reliable stock. How then did you turn against me into a corrupt wild vine? They rebelled against the Lord. They didn't put their faith in their God. And this was reflected in what they said and what they did, the fruit that came from their lips and from their hands. Now, even though Isaiah was writing to people who lived thousands of years ago, we can, we can see that same thing happening today because in his grace, God still provides everything. He provides all that we need. And it's God who makes the sun rise in the morning and set in the evening. It is God who continues to send rain on this earth so that it can continue to bear its fruit. God is the one who provides the air that we breathe and everything that we need to eat. God is the one who gives us a purpose in life and really gives us everything that we need. As we also read in the book of James, every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. And these gifts also include our ability to give praise and thanks to God. Because you see, it is God who gives us our time in this world. He gives us our lifetime as our time of grace, our time to come and to know him as he has revealed himself to us in the Bible. And once we see that God has accomplished for us, he also gives us this opportunity to reflect our thanks in what we say and do. God is the one who gives us the opportunity to give him praise by how we act. That's why we also read in the book of Ephesians, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God gives us everything that we need, not only to survive, but also so that we can live as his people and give praise to him. 
And yet so often our human nature rebels against God's goodness. Instead of putting our trust entirely in the Lord and giving praise and thanks to Him as the creator and, and the provider and the sustainer of our world, we're tempted to take credit for ourselves. We're tempted to say, well, I I earned this. But in doing that, we forget that God is one who has even given us the abilities that we have to live and survive in our world. And because of this rebellion, God, God disciplines his people. Now for those Old Testament Israelites, the Lord allowed trouble to come into their lives. In our our lesson, it talks about how God allowed their defenses to be taken down, how he withheld the rain. And and we can see that in a number of cases in the Old Testament history, God did exactly that. He he took away their defenses, and as more than once that nations from the outside came in and conquered his people. In fact, there were times when even the temple in Jerusalem was leveled. He allowed the people to put their trust in idols so that they could see how useless that really was. And the same thing happens today. So many in our world are are tempted not to trust in in God, the, the one who has revealed himself in his word, but in their own strength, in their own effort, in the idols of this age. And so often God simply allows that to happen. We're told in in Romans chapter 1, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts. Trusting in anything but the true Lord only leads to trouble. And people have to learn that lesson the hard way. Sometimes we have to learn that lesson the hard way. And eventually, when Christ returns in glory, everyone will have to stand before the Lord and face his judgment. But still, despite how many times the world has rebelled against him, how many times our own human nature has rebelled against him, our Lord is compassionate. And in his grace, he makes us the garden of his delight. Instead of forcing us to make up for what we have done wrong, because we know we never could, It's the Lord who provides a solution for our sin and for our guilt. Towards the end of Isaiah, the Lord would say through his prophet, I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled that no one gave support, so my own arm worked salvation for me, and my own wrath sustained me. God provided an answer for all that rebellion. And that answer comes, of course, in... Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus came into this world, he came into this world as our righteousness. That is, he lived that perfect life for us. Because even though Jesus was tempted, even though he was tempted to chase after the idols of this world with the temptations that the devil laid in front of him, Jesus always had his heavenly father and his father's will in his heart. Even though Jesus was tempted by the same temptations that the devil uses on us, he never once bore sour grapes. Instead, Jesus always bore choice fruit. He always did what was right. And then because Jesus understood that we could not make up for our sin and our rebellion, Jesus was also willing to go and suffer in our place. He was willing to take his guilt on his shoulders so that when he died on the cross, our sin and guilt could be taken away once and for all. And in its place, Jesus is the one who gives us righteousness. That's what it means when it says the Lord is our righteousness. 
He he transfers it to us so that when our Lord looks at us, he doesn't see rebellious, sinful creatures anymore. Instead, he sees righteous children of God. And because the Lord has done all of this for us, that's how we become the garden of God's delight. We can live as his people. We can live in the righteousness that God has provided. And and as is described in our lesson for this morning, this picture, this parable, the Lord cares for us. Uh, We also read in the book of Ezekiel where the Lord promises, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Like in the parable, Jesus gets rid of all the stones. He gets rid of that rebellious, sinful human nature. He gives us something new. Jesus also prunes us. He allows us to go through troubles and trials so that we can learn to depend on him all the more and put our trust in him all the more. Jesus gives us all that we need so that he can continue to feed our faith through the gospel and word and sacrament. And just like in our parable, Jesus is the one who who puts up a a fence around us, who who guards and protects us in our love, so that even though we may go through troubles and trials, God uses those for our eternal good. And because God has done all this for us, because he has become our righteousness, because he has made us into his people, the vineyard of his delight, may we live as his people. May we not chase after the idols of this world, but realize that everything we have, even our strength, even the faith in our heart, comes to us as a gift of God's grace. And because God has done all that for us, may we strive to live our lives giving praise and thanks and honor to his name. May we always remember that the Lord is the one who takes care of his vineyard. The Lord is the one who provides what we need. The Lord is the one in whom we can put our trust every day. Amen. But may this grace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may it keep your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You are welcome to join us at Emmanuel Lutheran Church, just across the street from the post office in Taylor, Arizona. On Sunday mornings, our Bible study begins at 7.30 and worship begins at 8.30. in your word Curb those who by deceit or sword would seek to overthrow your son and to destroy what he has done Jesus Christ, your power make known, for you are Lord of Lords alone. Defend your Christendom that we may sing your praise eternally. Bless the world. Send peace and unity on earth. Support us in our final strife and lead us out of death to
steadfast in your word. Curb those who by deceit or sword would seek to overthrow your Son and to destroy what he has done.